I'm Georgia Cower, the president of AMS, and I'm delighted to be here with this wonderful audience and with Suzanne Cusick tonight. I want to thank Elaine Sisman and Marty Fellman, her husband, who endowed this lecture series that we've enjoyed for the past few years and will continue to enjoy in the future. Suzanne Cusick needs no introduction to this society, which conferred upon her the distinction of honorary membership in 2014. Three years later, she was also named an honorary member for the Society for Ethnomusicology, the only person to date to be named to this status in both societies, I believe. As president of AMS from 2018 to 2020, Suzanne led the society through the untimely passing of its executive director, Bob Judd. <clears throat> and as if, as if that weren't enough, the COVID-19 pandemic, can you imagine? With grace, compassion, and calm, she guided our ship through, through these storms while securing an excellent executive director mounting a successful online conference for the first time and creating emergency fund programs for members in need. Because of her concern for the less privileged, a few of her friends established the Suzanne Cusick Fund for Independent Scholars in our, in our lower income categories. An outpouring of generosity has augmented these funds, and it has been my great pleasure as president of AMS to get to know the recipients and to witness their enthusiasm and gratitude. Are any of them here tonight? If you are, raise your hand. Suzanne's research has contributed to and helped to create different moments of disciplinary revolution in the fields of feminist musicology, queer musicology, and acoustomology, the study of sonic modes of knowing and being. Her award-winning Francesca Caccini at the Medici Court, Music and the Circulation of Power, University of Chicago Press, 2009, grounded in impeccable archival work, also drew on and helped to shape feminist critical thought. Her forthcoming book, Men Hearing Women in Medicean Florence, focuses on gendered, eroticized, and political modes of hearing in early modern Italy. This interest in hearing and sound has led Suzanne to acoustomology, which she has brought to the field of musicology in exciting ways. Her early work in this field, exploring the use of noise, loud music, and gender coercion in the detention and interrogation of prisoners received the Philip Brett Award in 2007. A later article on the effects of loud music on the psyches and bodies of prisoners as well as their torturers stands as the most retrieved article in the Journal of the Society for American Music since it appeared in 2008. In that same year, she published a fifth column for radical musicology entitled Musicology, torture, repair. That brief reflection opened the way for a new understanding of what musicology could be and do by looking at the other side of torture, repair. Her lecture tonight is entitled Dreaming Reparative Musicologies in a, a Paranoid Time. Please welcome Suzanne C. Cusick. Thank you. Enough already, as we say in New York. <laughs> Dear Georgia, thank you for the honor and sweet surprise of this invitation, which characteristically I first mistook for a practical joke. <laughs> so unlikely did it seem. More flattered and honored than I could ever say, and grateful to you and the board, I nonetheless felt uneasy in accepting though it would be months before I understood why. Now, 
I know that I have been triggered by your invitation. The last time I stood at an AMS podium, the air was heavy with grief and a palpable sense of institutional crisis. And both feelings, as you just said, were swiftly amplified by the first worst season of the COVID pandemic. All my long repressed feelings from that time came flooding back. And I worried that just the sight and sound of me at a podium might bring others' feelings back too. I hope that doesn't happen. But when we talked on the phone about it, all I could do was prevaricate, mumbling something about a schedule jammed with deadlines for work that wasn't quite right for this setting. To calm me down, you advised, just tell me what, tell us what you're thinking about. This lecture is a partial answer. The day we talked, I was thinking about abortion, guns, and the end of the world, not musicology. By abortion, I meant the recently revoked right of a person to bodily self-sovereignty. By guns, I meant the right of a person to be free from the constant conscious fear of sudden death caused by someone else's rage, fear, or despair a freedom that I understood all too well could vary dramatically with privilege. And by the end of the world, I meant the very real possibility of human extinction at our own carbon spewing hands. But before that end of the world, I meant to, the end of a world that valued thought that didn't have obvious utilitarian value or intellectual or artistic work done for their own sakes. The end of a world in which academics and intellectuals were free to imagine other worlds aloud. The end of a world in which being a musicologist was a plausibly respectable, reliably middle-class thing to do with one's life. I was filled with a kind of grim resignation, exhausted from the efforts to repress my feelings about all those things. Since then, world events have only heightened my feeling that I live in a world hostile to my physical and psychological well-being. Perhaps we all do now. So when we hung up, I retreated to my happy place, a book that I had meant to begin in 2014, only to, to be derailed and deflected from it again and again and again. The book isn't really musicology, at least not of the sort that, say, Dollhouse would recognize because it's not at all about works, musical style, or famous professional musicians, except as minor characters. Nor do I expect it to be some meta-intervention in historiography. But it's a story that I love thinking about, one that, since I retired, has pushed my thinking farther and farther from any discipline's norms. Naturally, it's set in Florence, where, in 1620, Medici courtier Sinolfo Altieri was arrested in the apartment of a professed and cloistered nun from the Fescobaldi family of wine barons. His defense against the capital crime of sexually violating a nun was that he had only been there to hear her sing. An outrageous claim, yet perfect as a retirement project for me. <laughs> because it condenses everything where I lost my place. Everything I've ever talked about as a scholar, singing, sex, and confinement. <laughs> More broadly, the archival traces of the main character's predicaments contain a story about the role music and beliefs about musical pleasure played in non-musicians' lives, having life or death consequences for Otieri, and bringing considerable harm to people caught up in the scandal. Harms like prison, torture, the blacksmith's abandonment of his wife, the temporary impoverishment of a once fashionable convent, and the enduring shame the Frescobaldi still feel about their infamous antecedent. Otieri's defense claim is the most tantalizing part of the story. How, I ask myself, could anyone in his right mind have made such a claim when his life was at stake? When I tell friends about it, they usually respond with a barely suppressed guffaw. And yet, it was his sole defense, the defense that people then prominent in Florence's musical world were willing to affirm by testing on his behalf, testifying on his behalf. Eventually, worn down by the guffaws, I came to agree. But one day, I mentioned Otieri's defense to Gail Murkison, 
and she didn't laugh. Gail was willing to believe that music could have been an erotic ex but not sexual experience because of her experience as a musician in black churches. Our conversation gave me hope that there was a way to imagine his defense as not a crazy lie. As a still card-carrying musicologist, I felt obliged to identify the early modern discourse in which Otieri's defense could have made sense. I read everything I could find on erotic culture in early modern Italy, focusing, of course, on music, only to discover that the literature focused entirely on sex. Aware that many elites seemed still to be immersed in humanism's reclaiming of classical ideas, I also read Plato, Foucault, and many less obvious sources on classical erotics. Finally, I settled in to read in tandem two early modern sources, the transcript of exactly what Otieri and his defense witnesses said to their interrogators, and Marsilio Ficino's 1484 gloss on Plato's symposium in the 1594 Italian edition I had downloaded from the internet. These sources had one word one totally unexpected, counterintuitively used, glaringly odd word in common. That word was coito, for non-italophones that spelled C-O-I-T-O, and it means what you think it means. <laughs> it's a word that both Ficino's fictionalized dinner guest, Giovanni Cavalcante, and according to one of his defense witnesses, Sinolfo Otieri, declared to be the opposite of the erotic. Interestingly, both went on to identify sound, music, and conversation as potential sources of erotic experience. Every now and again, the solution to a research quandary makes a girl, girl whoop. This one did, and for more reasons than one. Reading secondary literature in Ficino quickly led me to the near unanimous opinion among 21st century experts that Ficino's declaration had been an effort to deflect homophobic conjectures about the group of scholars with whom he socialized, and in particular, homophobic conjectures about his friendship with Cavalcante. Like I said, everything I like to think about. More on point, as I read the primary texts through which Ficino's ideas about Eros were transmitted, heterosexualized, and transformed into what used to be called platonic love, I realized that references to these texts were scattered like breadcrumbs in Otieri's testimony and in that of his defense witnesses. I concluded that Otieri, Otieri's and his witnesses' claims were meant to project him as a platonic lover modeled on the one Pietro Bembo describes in the last section of the Book of the Courtier, a lover for whom love of music and conversation about music could actually grow into a sexless but powerful love of a person who made the music and conversation. Through shared music making and conversation with their beloveds, such lovers could together gain the knowledge and spiritual insight to approach what Plotinus, one of Ficino's sources, had called the goal of Eros, contact with the disembodied beauty that was the divine. Filled with satisfaction, I sat back to contemplate the scene described in the bit of testimony that used the word coito. The scene took place in the home of the Skieja sisters, virtuosic singers who were apparently also sex workers. Otieri and his friend had spent the evening there, listening first to one sister and the other, sometimes both in duet. Toward dawn, the friend asked Otieri if he should go, so that Otieri could take his pleasure. It was then that Otieri said he took no pleasure from coito, but from music and conversation about it. Is there something more to be said here about the erotics of listening, I wondered, thinking vaguely about possible resonances with Susan McClary's work? Immediately, another question popped into my head, one inspired by indigenous scholar Dylan Robinson's book, Hungry Listening. Were Otieri and his friends practicing what Robinson calls extractive listening, which he says characterizes settler culture? The question brought me up short. I realized with dismay both that my little retirement happy place was veering 
even further a slant of real musicology, and that it was blithely complicit with all that the word settler now means to me, and to many of us, thanks to Robinson's book. Dazed, I confronted the need to situate the story mentally in a world much wider than Florence, and to be ready to apply decolonizing and anti-racist thinking. This, in a book that already focused embarrassingly on the same old cast of characters, immensely wealthy, privileged people whose lives are relatively easy to imagine from within the fantasy world of our own making, the Charles Mills says, all we white people live in. Unsettled as I was by this glimpse of my own unthinking whiteness, the thrill of satisfaction's evil twin, self-satisfaction, vanished. In its place was a fog of negative affects like shame, doubt, and fear, through which I knew I would eventually have to grapple with my own question. In denial about the hard work ahead, I closed the file, focused on my other deadlines, and went on vacation to stare at the sea and to think. When I first got back to work, my mood was worse than before. I had stumbled on an old paper of mine. In that paper, I argued that the musicologies needed to be rebuilt from the ground up, starting with the definition of music. I had based my argument partly on Gary Tomlinson's observation that the root word of musicology had been imbricated ideologically with European assertions of cultural superiority in opposition to song, sound, speech, or noise, used as a weapon of European imperialism and its adjuvant white supremacy. Using the sideways logic of everyday, not academic thinking, to analyze what Guantanamo prisoners had told me, I found myself tracing that usage to the use of Western popular music to torture them. My own grim words left me stuck in a very dark place about music and musicology, wondering how to go on. I shared my feelings with an old friend in our field. I see how you could connect those dots they said impatiently, but then what? What are we supposed to do? Teach the history of oppression in music class? With those words, my friend launched a torrent of their own dark feelings, their fears about music, musicology, and the worlds we could both see ending. Fear of pressure to teach Western music as oppression. Fear of pressure not to. Fear of censorship from both right and left in their own classrooms fear that precious knowledge about the range of human acoustical imagination could soon be lost, much as classical Mediterranean knowledges had largely been, or seemed, lost in the so-called Dark Ages. Fear that there was no happy place in music anymore, or rather that there was dwindling social permission to indulge our love for music and musicians, the love that had driven us to work so hard to know so much about both, and to share what we loved and knew with others, even music was no longer a place to be safe and happy, to open up to and in our love. As we talked, piling fear upon fear, I suddenly realized we were both struggling against what queer theorist Eve Sedgwick had called, following psychoanalyst Melanie Klein, the paranoid position. As Sedgwick explains it, Klein posited two positions from which people respond to circumstances beyond our control that foreclose the gratifications we seek, the paranoid schizoid position and the reparative depressive position. The reparative depressive position, Sedgwick says, I'm quoting now, inaugurates ethical possibility, an empathetic view of the other as at once good, damaged, integral, and requiring and eliciting love and care. It includes care of the self in the form of, quote, the concern to provide the self with pleasure and nourishment in an environment that is perceived as not particularly offering them. Freud dismissed the reparative position as antithetical to credible knowledge claims because it was concerned with mere pleasure. He promoted instead the paranoid position as suitable for serious thought. The position that, according to Sedgwick, relies on anticipating the negative 
on relentless criticism of oneself and others and the development of strong theory, that is, elegant and sweeping, if sometimes reductive, explanations of a wide range of phenomena. The paranoid position places its faith in exposure, that is, in the naming of the negating circumstances we anticipate, internalize, and fear. In the paranoid epistemology, Sedgwick writes, it is implausible to suppose that truth could be even an accidental occasion of joy, inconceivable to imagine joy as a guarantor of truth. Of course we're all paranoid now, I thought. Not only because the paranoid position has been the preferred one from which to make knowledge claims for a century, we in the United States are immersed in a culture that is an endless festival of paranoid thinking, eroding confidence and eclipsing joy in relation to absolutely everything. We've all gone a little crazy finding the flaws in everything as well as in each other, reveling in each dark discovery as we would in the sinful consumption of an entire bag of potato chips or an entire pint of ice cream after a bad day at work. The paranoid has been every academic in every academic's intellectual default for at least 30 years, infecting even the once joyous fields of feminist and queer musicologies. And my friend and I were just as caught up in the angry self-destructive festival as everyone else, though we had different targets for our drives to expose harm. As we talked, our thoughts turned to the public pressure on and against the humanities that is constantly in the air now. Why, we wondered, are humanists in particular pressured by the zeitgeist to teach oppression while having our programs and their potential for teaching the practices of human creativity and joy inexorably shrunk? Whose interests are served by this pressure? Whatever interest it is served, it opposes what Sylvia Winter described as the defining trait of our species, the telling of stories, including those not told in words. Why isn't learning to be, how to be, fully be, caught for a time in the network of relationships that are made audible and palpable by music? Why isn't that a public good available to everyone? Yes, it would inevitably be to be caught in the bittersweet, the grace and beautiful design of a Mozart quartet played on near-perfect instruments, made by near-perfect craftsmen, now in the hands of other near-perfect craftsmen, all of them dead or dying, and all as politically and ethically fallible as we are, all as trapped in an imperial system like the one from which we mostly now recoil. Sedgwick would ask, what is so mere about the miracles of grace and beauty? What is so mere about learning how to be caught in a prolonged moment with the intersection of ephemeral, frail entities and almost touch the idea of beauty that human beings' actions can make real? Substitute for a Mozart quartet, a 14th century virile, or Nina Simone singing Mississippi Goddamn, or learning to decipher what Robin James calls the demonic calculus behind the formal play in Beyonce's aptly titled Formation. What is so mere about discovering and then sharing the knowledge that could enable others to know these bittersweet relationships with the living and the dead, with the once living materials with which we will have briefly shared the earth, and thus to participate fleetingly and consciously in the energy we call creativity. We were on a roll. One decidedly paranoid answer to all our questions about whose interests were served came in a flash. The shrinking of the humanities that denies the next generation the chance to know such experiences and that puts possibly lethal pressure on what most of us do daily, whether for love or for money, is only happening in some places. I mean, did we think Harvard would ever close its music department? Or Yale's faculty be forced to submit their syllabi to the legislature for approval? No, of course not. It's no shade on people who work at Harvard or Yale to observe that the elite have no intention of giving up music studies or the other humanities. But, I thought darkly, Knowledge of classical music, history, classics, philosophy, you name it, all that knowledge is now the object of the same kind of resource hoarding that the super-rich have engaged in for the last 40 some odd years. 
This hoarding of cultural knowledge, its pleasures and its joys, amounts to class-based censorship said to be wrought by nameless market forces beyond anyone's control. With a paradoxical but discernible logic, this very hoarding of resources combines with overt censorship to distract us from the urgent reparative work of decolonizing music and musicology in ways that would preserve for everyone a right to the mereness of knowledge, pleasure, and joy. And we music scholars, who are in a very real sense what anthropologists call tradition bearers, we need to pull ourselves out of the paranoid vortex that constantly threatens to engulf us, lest the hoarding of human imagination's miracles succeed. We need to recover the love, the care, the joy, the better to share them as knowledge is both reparative and repaired. But how? By drinking. <laughs> it's water. It's not vodka, I promise. Consider the rhetorical questions my friend and I asked in our litany of complaint. Every one of them acknowledged a situation that gave us pain. Yet every one of them also articulated an air pocket of hope where a musicologist in the reparative position might find enough psychic oxygen to go on. It was almost as if Sedgwick's ghost was in the Zoom with us, masquerading his intuition, but teaching us how to change position, how to acknowledge, welcome, and learn from our ghosts, even the ones we didn't like, so that we might, in Avery Gordon's words, be haunted in the name of a will to heal to imagine things that could have been and can be otherwise. Indeed, plenty of our colleagues in this century have been acknowledging the ghosts in musicology's archive. That archive, really a collection of archives scattered all over the globe, turns out to have preserved astonishing things, including unselfconscious, matter-of-fact evidence about the emotional complexities of colonialist musical practices for both colonizers and colonized. As a result, it is ever easier to understand that our music's histories were otherwise than we supposed a generation ago. Our stories in which efforts at musical and cultural epistemicide failed in the face of musics and cultures too powerful to be crushed. And our stories that unexpectedly solve long his long-standing historiographical problems. There are now too many such colleagues for me to name, but a lot of them are on this year's program, or in the book exhibit, or will be cited in the papers, or all of the above. If too much of their work still remains confined to monographs, collections, and journal articles, relegated only to the margins and pullouts of standard textbooks, there is now so much new knowledge challenging the old narratives of my youth that the textbooks will simply have to change soon because of the market force that we and our colleagues represent. <clears throat> Sorry. New textbooks, if they are to be written, need new narratives. Those, in turn, can only be developed from the very hard work of profound epistemic repair. Hard and fierce wrestling with epistemologies and ontologies of sound and music, other than the ones that we have assumed to be self-evident, or that we did assume to be self-evident when we were young. This wrestling, with, which some of our colleagues already do, will make the 90s boom of trying to apply literary feminist and queer theory to music seem like child's play. Yet if Audre Lorde was right that the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house, all of us need to develop new tools. One such tool, I thought, might have come from the question that had popped into my head, popping the balloon of self-satisfaction I had enjoyed in my happy place. Were Sanofa Autieri and his friends engaged in what Dylan Robinson called extract extractive listening at the Skedja sisters' house? Trying to imagine how the question might be epistemically useful led me down an interesting but ethically dubious path, only to yield to a better one. 
Early in his book, Robinson suggests one think of listening not as an act, exactly, so much as what Mary Louise Pratt called a contact zone, where disparate cultures of the listener and the listened to meet, clash, and grapple with each other, often in highly asymmetrical relations of domination and subordination. That is, he proposes that listening is fundamentally a relation in which certain positionalities give rise to certain kinds of actions, including extraction, which is defined by indigenous scholar Leanne Simpson as a kind of theft meant to remove, quote, all of the relationships that give whatever is being extracted meaning. What relationships gave listening, uh, gave meaning to Autieri's and his friends listening? Neither of them were settlers, but because of their wealth and class position, they were probably unwitting or half-witting accomplices to the financial basis of the Medici's settler colonial aspirations, and they may well have owned slaves. I hypothesize that their listening habits might well have reinforced an extractive impulse that was consonant with emerging settler slavery culture, in that those habits could constantly reinforce the proprietary attitudes that all elite Florentine men had toward both pleasure and the body resor bodily resources of less powerful people. Such men were raised to believe that pleasure produced by subordinated people's work was theirs for the taking. In the co contact zone that was both men's listening in the Skedja sisters' home, both listened from a position of gendered social superiority. Both assumed their right to extract pleasure from the sisters' bodies, albeit different kinds of pleasure. Both presumably meant to compensate the sisters in some ways, probably according to the unwritten rules of gift exchange by which social relationships in early modern Florence were created, sustained, and understood. In that system, gifts from the wealthy to the working were under ordinarily meant to sustain the sharp asymmetry of power that characterized Medici and Florence. Occhieri, it seems, extend, intended an exceptionally extravagant compensation to the younger of the sisters. His friend testified that Occhieri had already dowered her and asked his friend to find her a suitable husband. In the context of the defense strategy, this information was meant as just one more example of his extravagance toward other excellent musicians, both women and men, in exchange for the privilege of observing music lessons, sitting in as they played or sang, or making music with them when they visited his home. Whatever the amount of the dowry might have been, the gift was, I think, relationally a bit over the top in that it would have seemed to create a relationship of patronage similar to the ones that the Medici created with people like Perry and the various Caccini. Men like Perry were sutured into relationships of service in which they occasionally exchanged the gifts of their musical knowledge and virtuosity for retainers, dowry assistance for their daughters, and possible court service for their sons. Artists and class women like Francesca Caccini Angelica Furini and Arcangelo Palladini exchanged their musical gifts for stipends, help placing their eventual children in service, dowries paid to either the father or the husband, and husbands who constituted a kind of living certificate of their sexual continence and social respectability. That certification of sexual continence distinguished these women from sex workers but also implicitly distinguished them as at least notionally capable of the intellectually, intellectual and spiritual ambitions that Ficini and Neoplatonists associated with musical excellence, ambitions that were otherwise assumed only to characterize the leisure class. Because it mimicked the process by which the Medici court's women artists were elevated to intellectual and spiritual respectability, Otieri's gift of a dowry and a husband to Schiedja could have been taken as a gesture of very high esteem, high esteem for her intellectual and spiritual capacities as manifest in the musical excellence he so admired. That is, his gift could have seemed to afford her a kind of contingent circumstantial social equality with someone like Francesca Caccini, 
who in turn Altieri apparently treated as though she were a princess. In Altieri's mind, his listening to Schiedge's singing in conversation about music would not have seemed extractive but additive because it used his power to improve her position in the network of relationships that constituted their social world. In the context of Altieri's defense, the implication was meant to be that his lavish gifts to Frescobaldi, we're talking books, music, instruments, renovations to her apartment and to her convent's building, were to be interpreted as tokens of the very highest esteem for the musical gifts that signified her intellectual and spiritual ambition. Thus, theirs too was to be taken as a relationship driven by a shared desire for the goal of true Neoplatonic eros, the knowledge and insight to apprehend the divine. I'm not quite sure that's right though. Not as an interpretation of Altieri's listening habits and not as an ethical use of Robinson's and Simpson's idea of extractive. Although I, the question I turned their idea into did help me think more about the meaning of Altieri's gift to Schiedja and the reasons its citation was at best a clumsy defense, I think that the idea of extractive listening was not meant as a tool for me to use on 17th century Florence. In, so to speak, picking up a tool from their world and using it to till my own garden, I had extracted Robinson's and Simpson's idea from the relationships that gave it meaning, relationships among the indigenous scholars on this continent who mean to reclaim their epistemologies and ontologies. I think, that is, that Robinson meant for me to use the concept to understand the relationships involved in a story that he tells in his book. In a land claim between the Gitson and the Watsowitan people in British Columbia in 1985, a lawyer for one party asked Mary Johnson, a Gitson chief, to perform a dirge song associated with her collectively owned oral history. The judge, a white settler, balked at the idea but eventually allowed it. Another Kitson witness explained in his testimony how the song could be a citation of the law. While they were singing that song in a quiet way, I can feel it today, it memories back to the past what's happened in the territory. This is why this song, this memorial song, while the chief is sitting there, I can still feel it today while I am sitting here. I can hear the brook, I can hear the river run, this is what the song is all about. You can feel the air of the mountain. This is what the memorial song is, to bring your memory back into that territory. This is why the song is sung, why we are still doing it today. I can feel it. That's how they know the law of Indian people, and this goes on for many years. Robinson clarifies, it acts as the law of Indian people by conveying the conveying the embodied feeling of history. The singing voice brings listeners back into relationship with place, not just through hearing, but through its feeling. There is in this set of relationships no place for extracting aesthetic pleasure alone from all the rest that could give the song meaning. I can think of no evidence that any such set of relationships were what gave songs meaning to 17th century Florentines. I expect people smarter than me to tell me about them afterwards. Not to Otieri, not to Frescobaldi, and not to their judges. The Gitson ontology of music seems incompatible with, well, with Western modernity's ontology of music, premised as it is largely on the purely aesthetic pleasure we take in what we hear. That's a premise that I think needs some serious repair. A sideways move led me to another way of approaching the question that Robinson's book had raised in my mind. When the question about extraction had first popped into my head, I had meant to start a new section of my book's draft, temporarily headed, what would Audre Lorde say? Meaning, what would she say about the erotics of Otieri's relationship with Frescobaldi? What would she say? One thing she did say in her essay on the uses of the erotic 
is that pleasure extracted from another person's body solely for one's own gratification is, by definition, pornographic, not erotic. Pornography, she writes, is a direct denial of the power of the erotic, for it represents the suppression of true feeling. Pornography emphasizes sensation without feeling. It's clear in context that feeling encompasses emotional intimacy, reciprocity, and mutual respect. So I think Lord might have absolved Otieri of pornographic listening, but have doubts about some of his friends. That set me thinking, sensation without feeling. Koita is the very opposite of eros removing all of the relationships that give whatever is being extracted meaning. The value of music being premised on the pleasure we take from it. Lord's pornographic is right next door to Robinson's extractive and surprisingly reminiscent of Ficino's rejection of Coito as the anti-eros. Yet the concept cloud, if you will, formed by Lord's pornographic, Robinson's extractive, and Ficino's coito as anti-eros describe a lot of listening practices that have become the defaults in modern culture. What if it was relationship itself, the connection with another person for whom music was the most interesting and important thing in life that drove Atieri to take his pleasure with all those musicians, including Schiaggia and Frescobaldi? Was the intimacy that can arise from a shared love for and deep knowledge of music, was that the relationship that in their world gave music making and conversations about music meaning? Did he and Frescobaldi both love music as a connection otherwise denied? And is that why they spent hours every day talking at the convent's parlatorio grate, provoking scandalous fantasies in the minds of the other nuns? Almost certainly that was true for Frescobaldi, cloistered as she was against her will to sustain a family tradition. Otieri too was trapped by family expectations. For a man of his rank ought not to have spent all day at his home singing and playing music while his family's vast land holdings in the Maremma went literally to seed and ruin. Is that what the musical erotic, the opposite of Koito, was for them? A relationship that inaugurated a shared temporary escape from situations that otherwise gave them neither pleasure nor nourishment? Is the reparative experience of music, its sounding antagonism to oppressive social norms, what their judges call, could not abide? Like the ancient Greeks whom she credits, Lord describes Eros as an energy, a resource within each of us the power which comes from sharing deeply any pursuit with another person. The sharing of joy, whether physical, emotional, psychic, or intellectual, forms a bridge between the sharers, which can be the basis for understanding much of what is not shared between them and lessens the threat of their difference. Could music, more expansively imagined, serve as such a bridge? On a conference paper I gave over 30 years ago, not at this conference, I likened a person's relationship with music to their erotic relations with another person. It was a useful proposition in the moment, but even then I knew it was a little wrong. Strategically couched in a then familiar fantasy about heard music, namely that we experience, what we, ex what we experience as music's presence is like that of another person. It was already not my own fantasy. My own fantasy lay then too far below the level of language to explain succinctly what I had meant when, as a toddler, I would run to the radio whenever a particular song played because I wanted to be that music. I want to try now to advance the very, very weak theory that has grown from those babyish words because for me, it helps to repair the old ideological definition of music that was used for so long in the modern period as a marker of settler and white supremacist subjectivity and as a weapon of cultural violence. 
Sound is energy. It is energy that takes the form of periodic variations in the atmospheric pressure on my body. My body's equal and opposite response, its pushing back, is the basic mechanism by which eventually I hear that energy is sound. What I think I hear is myself moving with the atmosphere, as if the cells and molecules of my flesh and bones were shoots of grass waving in a wind, or pebbles on a rocky coast moving in and out, in and out with the sea. The kind of energy that humans call sound is a constant on our planet, a complex force field that is as much a condition of our existence as air. But it is a constant that we learn to perceive very selectively with intense focus on the energy we receive through the acutely sensitive flesh and bones of our ears and relative dismissal of the energy the rest of our bodies receive. Eventually, we turn that energy into a source of information and judgment. Is it sound, noise, or music? Is it a rifle? And if so, where? Should I duck? Is there time to run away? We also turn it into a medium for sharing information and judgment. Sound is information and judgment. is the shared premise for what we call speech and what we call music, as it is for the many ideas that human minds have developed in and about both speech and music. Music, when it comes to us, is a highly intentional patterning of the force field of energy that is a condition of existence that literally touches us with specific movements in the force field of energy, putting us in touch with other bodies living and not in the environment, moving all of us selectively, depending on how our parts can move to specific frequencies, but moving all of us, living and not, that can even partially move with those frequencies together as though we were temporarily parts of one organism or parts of a temporary world that exists in the real one. If one thought of music like that, a person's relationship with music would not best be likened to that of one person to another, Altieri to Frescobaldi, you to me, but instead would best be likened to that of the so-called listener becoming part of a greater whole, literally, one entity among all the other parts of a greater whole of which all the conscious parts have been made acutely aware by the patterning of their body's own haptic and auditory responses. That is, any one person's relationship with music amounts to their positional participation in a network of relationships made of the pushing and pulling call and response energy that pulses between and among us all, a network of which we have been made acutely aware. For any one entity to take pleasure from all the other's movements would be absurd, or an ethical violation, or both, because the shared experience of the network of re relationships would be the thing, the point. That flesh and bones awareness of our connection with other entities in our environment, our participation in a network of connections made by and of the push and pull of the energy pulsing between us, that is, I believe, what it is about music that we love and that brings us joy. If joy is taken to be the sudden awareness that this is not a dream, but that we really are alive, not dead, and not an image on a screen, physically connected, not alone, or if joy is taken to be that familiar burst of immense sensory and cognitive stimulation that we know in the presence of music, this joyful awareness is, I believe, prior to responses of pleasure, pain, information, judgment, emotion with names and language, recognition of patterns, the signs and codes of some representational scheme, or anything else. What would follow from such an account of the phenomenon we call music? One thing that follows for me is a clearer understanding of just how closely music and eros overlap. In her book on ancient Greek thought about eros, Eros the Bittersweet, classicist and poet Anne Carson defines eros as a diamond, a disembodied energy. The diamond that is eros is a reach for the unknown, that, paradoxically, sustains itself by maintaining difference even in intimate connection. 
perpetually in between. It is both the drive to connect and the temporarily sustained satisfaction of that drive. Sound, and the special case of sound called music, are, too, energy that reaches out, yet retreats, moving our embodied selves in a call and response relationship that literally enacts in its pulsing our difference in intimacy. Sound and music are the energy the ancient Greeks called eros, or at least are forms of it that are profoundly embodied, but seem disembodied because they are invisible. This, I think to myself, is how Plotinus, Ficino, Bembo, and Castiglione could have privileged speech and music as optimal media for what they thought to be the connection toward which Eros reached. The connection with what they call the divine, but which we are more likely to call each other. That is, all the entities touched by the energy called sound in this space. This, I think, is how music and conversation about it can be a literal, physical, if invisible bridge between the sharers, which can be the basis for understanding much of what is not shared between them and lessens the threat of their difference. This is how music can archive for remembering and sharing how the wind blows, how the river runs, and therefore how it can constitute a people's law. I also think to myself, that this experience of music as a form of eros, an experience that centuries of ideology and epistemic habit have dulled or denied, might explain why some of us love music so much that, like Sinolfo Otieri, we base our whole adult lives on being engaged with it one way or another every day. We do so, I believe, because music reminds our bodies and therefore ourselves that the self-other thing of Western epistemology is nothing but a highly sophisticated fantasy, as are all the categorizing distinctions that have derived from it, reminds us that because of the ubiquity of pressure waves, we are constantly in a touching without touch connection with the living, no longer living, and never living entities with whom we share the world, and constantly in intimate relations with these entities, that are sustained by maintaining difference, differences that we might eventually come to understand. And that reminds us that we are invited to accept the ethical obligations our intimate difference places on our relationships with each other. Music, thus imagined, could repair our false sense that the universe and its pleasures are ours for the taking. Maybe it could help us repair the tools for engaging with music that our ancestors left for us. In the end, you'll be glad to hear, I've thought of music as not a matter of aesthetic pleasure, but as something more serious, much more serious, as a set of material thought experiments that invite us to a fully flesh and bone awareness of the relationships that could constitute a world, because they do for the time that the music lasts. This idea of music frees me, like Ashen Crawley, to imagine otherwise worlds. For me, this notion of music is reparative, too, because it enables ethical possibility, an empathetic view of the other as at once good, damaged, integral, and requiring and eliciting love and care. I would like to think that this way of experiencing music could contribute to a moral education that would incline our fellow persons to embrace a humbler view of our place in the universe than the one that characterized my generation when we were young, and to the less violent, more empathic relations with the world that would follow. But I don't think that's true. As a theory, it's probably no truer than the idea that music is an aesthetic experience, no less capable of being weaponized as it has been by security forces worldwide for as long as I've been alive. And it's dated, obviously, a fantasy informed by late 20th century ideas in relationships with and in the music of Cage, Oliveros, the Total Serialists, Free Jazz, Abby Lincoln, Disco, Funk, the syncretisms of people like Glass, Reich, and the Coltrane's, along with a lifetime of singing, playing, and teaching about early music, and of reading feminist, queer, and African-American texts. I 
could say that no one my age and demographic should even try to imagine what epistemic repair would look like in what is all too clearly an era of deepening epistemological crisis that is hardly limited to the current hoo-ha over AI. But I don't think that's quite true either. Honestly, I think there's a kind of beauty about being enmeshed in, the product of the web of all the people you've known, books you've read, music you've made or heard. It means that you've been fully alive, not yet dead and only occasionally reduced to an image on a screen. And you've been trying your damnedest to exchange gracefully love and care with the other entities trapped in the real time that you share, trying together to imagine something better. What's truer is that we all need to find reparative positions that restore our capacity for love and joy in our relationships with music, with each other, and with our often benighted world that we will all fumble at the work, trapped as we are by our formations as entities of a particular time and place, and that we all need to strike a balance between well-advised paranoia. Was that a rifle shot in the woods? Have they found the shooter yet? Should I hurry home and repair? I will go out for a quiet dinner with good friends, if prudently far away from where the shooter is likely to be. Inevitably, our collective efforts toward epistemic repair will eventually yield notions that feel right to a lot of people and begin to coalesce into new epistemologies and ontologies of music that provide those people with the pockets of air that give them hope and the energy to change. Some of those pockets of air seem likely to emerge this weekend from the voices of scholars younger than we are, Georgia, who will shape the musicology that is to come. Hmm, perhaps tomorrow morning at 10.15, there's a session about that. Thank you for moving in this space with me. May the sharing of joy, whether physical, emotional, psychic, or intellectual, suffuse your experience of this year's AMS. Love, Suzanne. Thank you.